Okay, we should have our Zoom attendees with us now. Again, my name is Mashan Wernley from Alaring Africa. I'm the Director of Operations. Thank you to everybody who's joined us tonight. We will be monitoring our chat box. So if you have any questions, please put them in there and we'll get to them. And I am very pleased to introduce James Curry. He was on our last webinar with us and gave us a sneak preview of his really exciting project that he's working on. James is a wildlife TV host. He's been featured on National Geographic, Discovery Channel, and NBC. He's a professional guide with 20 plus years experience specializing in wildlife and birding tours. He is also the author of When Eagles Roar, detailing his life as an African ranger and birding guide. And James, thank you for giving away a couple of your books at our last webinar. And I believe you'll be doing the same thing tonight. So keep an eye out for James at the end. He's going to be asking a couple of questions for his book giveaway. So thank you, James, for doing that. James also holds a bachelor's in Afri African languages and a master's in sustainable environmental management. His dissertation received a distinction and has been used as a model for assessing the relationships between wildlife areas and local communities. Thank you for joining us again, James, and bringing us deeper into your world and taking us behind the scenes and your journey to document the last of the big tuskers. James, could you tell us more about your project and what you've been working on? Sure, thanks, Michonne, and welcome everybody to my living room here in Florida. But I, I've got to say that in these times, I wish that I was stuck in one of our lodges. I also work for Wilderness Safaris, one of the partners of Alluring Africa. And uh, I wish I was stuck at one of our lodges because we have, a, before this whole COVID-19 happened, we had a Canadian couple that was just about to leave one of our lodges called Vumbura Plains in the Okavango Delta of Botswana. And they were about to hop on their plane and uh, Suddenly the, the government shut everything down. There were no planes coming or going and they were the last of our guests at our camps. So they decided to self isolate at our premier luxury safari lodge in the middle of the Okavango Delta. And they've been there for just over a month now. And they've got months to go with a skeleton staff with two game drives a day and drinking gin and tonics in the evening. And I'm sitting here self isolating in Florida and saying, Damn, I wish I was there right now, I can tell you that. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, and it really is a subject that has been very, very close to my heart for many years, is the plight of Africa's last remaining big tusker elephants or super tuskers. Now, to put this in context for you, a super tusker elephant or a big tusker is an elephant that has at least one tusk that weighs 100 pounds or more. And that qualifies him as a super tusker. The, the females sometimes get these really long tusks and nice ivory, but because the females' tusks are very thin, um, they never approach the size of 100 pounds. So you'll never find a female elephant being a 100 pounder. It'll only be a male elephant. Now, as a boy growing up, I remember these two legendary elephants very well. And these two are probably the most famous big tusker elephants in Africa. Their names were Ahmed and Muhammad. And they lived in northern Kenya. In fact, if Sanat is on with us, Sanat will know this area well because he lived in Kenya for many years, was born in Kenya. And uh, this is the Masabit Forest in northern Kenya, where Ahmed and Muhammad used to roam. And a very special friend of mine called Rosemary Twinham used to go down to Kenya from the state. She lives in Florida, and she used to go with the specific goal of photographing these two. And this is one of her images from 1972 of Muhammad and Ahmed to, together. Um, as they'd come out of the forest, Marzabit Forest, and she managed to capture this exceptional photograph. And then this one is another one of the legendary Ahmed, um, probably the most famous elephant in the world. And shortly after this photograph was taken, in fact, just a year after, Ahmed, he sadly passed away, um, actually of natural causes. And when they found his body, he was propped up majestically 
on his two pillars of ivory, his tusks, leaning slightly to one side on a tree. He died of peacefully of old age at the age of probably 65. And uh, he was the only elephant in the world to have been awarded presidential decree. Jomo Kenyatta was the president at that time and he offered armored, armored presidential decree because he was such an incredible animal. And so when he died, they did an autopsy and they, they actually found several Martini Henry rifle bullets in his body, which shows that there were these overzealous poachers that were trying to get hold of this ivory, but Ahmed had managed to outsmart them every single time. And he was such a fantastic elephant. When he, when he died, his ivory weighed in excess of 150 pounds a side. So think of that, a super tusker is an elephant that has ivory that weighs 100 pounds a side minimum, and his weighed 150 to 155 pounds on either side. Now I'm gonna tell you, take you back to present day. I remember marveling at those two elephants and I grew up as a, as a game ranger at a place called Pinda Private Game Reserve. And those that were on the call with us last week will remember I chatted a little bit about my time at Pinda. Um, but while I was there, I used to often go up Pinda's in the northeastern corner of South Africa on that map. It's a fantastic game reserve. Alluring Africa sends a lot of their guests there. It's a place where you can see uh, cheetah and elephant and lion during the day. And then um, in the afternoon or in the morning, the same day, you can go and swim with and dive with loggerhead uh, turtles and leatherback turtles and um, sorry, leatherback turtles and whale sharks and dolphins, and then come back to the reserve in the same day and see cheetah and elephants. So it's a fantastic place. And while I was there as a game ranger, I used to go up to a very special reserve right on the border of Mozambique called Tembi Elephant Park. And Tembi Elephant Park is the last refuge of indigenous elephants in this part of South Africa a place called KwaZulu-Natal, one of the provinces of South Africa. And the last remaining indigenous herd resides in Tembi Elephant Park. And they used to historically migrate all the way down from through Mozambique along what was called the, the, ivory, the ivory or the elephant coast down Mozambique and into sort of Tembi. And in the old days, they would go all the way down to the Western Cape and go back again along those Eastern forests. Um, sadly, Today, the last remaining indigenous herd is right up there in the southern tip of Mozambique and the northeastern corner of South Africa. So while I was there, I was always very cautious around the elephants there because during the Civil War, they had been shot at a lot. So when you approach these elephants in the 1990s, when I worked at Pinda, and I'd go up there often on, on vacation, um, it was always hair raising because these elephants would charge at you. They'd sometimes try to even flip your vehicles and a lot of them had what we call earrings, which are bullet holes in their ears where they'd actually been shot at in the past by hunters. And elephants never forget. They have amazing memories. So they would take out their wrath on, you know, us rangers who were actually, you know, trying to view them peacefully and had no ill intentions towards them. Um, but it was a, a fantastic experience seeing these wonderful creatures in their last remaining habitat. And they were probably around... 200 elephants at that time in Tembi Elephant Park. And I never realized how special this little population of elephants were until many years later, when in 2014, I was contacted by a friend of mine from Pinda, who still works there and lives there. And he said to me, James, the biggest elephant in the world with the largest ivory we've seen in decades still lives in Tembi Elephant Park. And he showed me a photograph of this elephant and my jaw just dropped. I couldn't believe that there was still one of these legendary super tuskers left on our planet. Because I thought they were all gone. I thought Muhammad and Ahmed were a thing of the past, something that we would never see again. And so I immediately presented a spec to discovery through a production company to do a series called Last Chance to See. And we went down with the film crew in December of 2014 to try and find 
is CeeLo. And uh, we uh, spent probably about seven days in the reserve looking for him. And for the first two days, we couldn't find him anywhere. And a good friend of mine, Tom Mahamba, who's a local ranger up at Tembi, escorted me and we tried to look for him everywhere and had no luck. And we thought, oh my gosh, maybe he's disappeared. And there's lots of thick forest in Tembi Elephant Park. So we were quite concerned as we got into day three and we looked and we still couldn't find him. And then I went back to the visitors camp that night. And the visitors camp is situated in the reserve, but it's fenced off with electrical wiring so that elephants can't get in there and it keeps, keeps everybody safe. And so we thought, oh my gosh, uh, we'll try again for, for Isilo. His name was Isilo in Zulu, which means king of kings. And he was just a magnificent elephant. And so late that night, I'm lying in my tent and I hear this rustling in my tent. And Isilo had broken into, after looking for him for three days, he had broken into the rest camp, the visitor's camp. And what he did was, and he used to do this quite often, by the way, he would take those mammoth pillars of ivory, place them onto the electrical wires of the fence, short the electrical wires with his tusks, because he knew he couldn't touch them with his trunk because he'd get shocked. So he'd short the wires with his tusks, and then he'd just push the entire fence down, walk over and go and get at the delectable trees in the visitor's area. And so this is my first video uh, that we managed to get of Isilo at about 12 midnight, right outside my tent after looking for this magnificent animal for three days. Come on, this way. This way. Here he comes. Isilo's right next to the tent. Right next to the tent. You realize how tiny you are. I mean, he stands nearly be tired. That is more than double my height. And he's seven tons in weight. There's a massive elephant. We've been looking for him all day. And the Silo came to us. First light. He was still nearby. I see that. Silo was fully aware of me. He showed no sign of aggression as he kept browsing. This guy. Seven tons of elephant. Magnificent animal. He comes here, he knows there's people here, so he's not here to bother people. If you come too close to him, he will give you a threat just to say, back off. But otherwise, he's a very calm elephant. Now and again, he goes and destroys maybe a tent, but not on purpose. If he's eating and the tent is on his way, he might just lean on it a little bit. But it's, it's not on purpose to destroy or man made things. The gentle giant wandered out of the rest camp the way he came in stepping over the flattened perimeter fence, unperturbed by us, back to his forest home. So that was my first encounter with the largest elephant on earth and the largest tusker on our planet at the time. And I went back to the States and we presented our spec and unfortunately it wasn't picked up for a variety of reasons. So I bought all the footage of Isilo and I decided I wanted to make, wanted to make a film about this elephant and find out 
if there were any other super tuskers left on earth and where could they be found? And unfortunately, after I flew back to the States, I got a call from Tom about uh, six weeks after I, I got back to the States and he said, we can't find a silo anywhere. Uh, we don't know where he is. And so I was absolutely shocked and really worried because they hadn't seen him for about two weeks. And I said, well, why don't we get, um, get some funding together and try and put up a helicopter, which we would pay for to go and look for a silo on the ground. And there was a, a very famous elephant photographer called Johan Marais, who was very involved in this as well. And he's written uh, two amazing books on super tuskers, if you're interested in reading those. Amazing photographic work. Um, and the Parks Board denied us um, the ability to search for him by helicopter. And we got really, really concerned. And about six weeks later, or uh, I don't know the exact time period, maybe six weeks or so later, they finally found his carcass. And surprisingly, just a mile from the... Um, the ranger station or the um, national park station in Tembe elephant park. And astoundingly his tusks had disappeared. His tusks were gone. And this was a, a great loss to us as South Africans, as part of our heritage. It was a loss to the Tembe people who own the land for that park. And in fact, the Tembe chief in Corsi Tembe um, had offered to donate the tusks on Isilo's death to Durban International Airport, to stand right at the entrance to Durban International Airport um, as a tribute to this amazing animal. We will never know how heavy his tusks were. We will never know exactly how long they were, but based on everything we know, his tusks weighed approximately 160 pounds a side and they were approximately 10 foot in length. So picture that, a set of ivory that's equally 160 pounds a side, give or take five pounds, and 10 foot in length. And sadly, that ivory is probably now sitting as a tribute to somebody to decorate a doorway in some part of the world. Um, and, and it's very sad that a lot of this ivory ends up in places like this. And so with the film, I wanted to look at the problem. Why were there thousands, thousands of super tuskers around in Africa just 60 to 80 years ago? And why are there so few left today? And as we started uncovering this, we realized that it wasn't just that we were losing big tusker elephants, but our film also started to uncover that elephants were losing ivory entirely, and populations of African elephants are becoming entirely tuskless. So when you look at Addo Elephant Park in South Africa, which genetically they have almost no tusks in that population because it, it stemmed from a a group of, I think, 11 or 13 elephants that had very small tusks that were the last animals that remained in Addo Elephant Park in the Eastern Cape after the hunters had, had shot all the animals with big tusks. I mean, they have tusklessness at over 90%. When you go to Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, they, their tusklessness among female elephants is approaching over 60%. When you go to Queen Elizabeth Park in Uganda, it's over 30%. And the accepted figure should be around 3% in a healthy population of elephants. So not only are we losing big tuskers, but we're also now seeing elephants like this, elephants that have no tusks at all. And essentially what's happening is these elephants are handicapped because elephants are right-handed and left-handed, just like us. They use their tusks. They have a working tusk and a lazy tusk. And so they use their tusks to dig for water, to dig their babies out of watering holes. They use their tusks to lift bark off trees. They use their tusks to, to push over trees and they use their tusks to protect themselves. So essentially what is happening 
is a form of human-induced evolution where the only way that elephants can survive is by becoming tuskless. And essentially what's happening is populations of elephants are now essentially handicapped. It's like having a, a population of humans running around with one arm or no arms. Yes, they can survive, but it becomes increasingly harder for them to do so. And so where are the other last remaining super tuskers? If Tembi Elephants only, Tembi Elephant Park has only got two to 300 elephants left, where are the other tuskers? And so I started with the film. We started filming at Tembi and uh, had this footage of a silo and went and found some of the other tuskers that lived at the time in Tembi. And there were only uh, two super tuskers at that time. It was a silo and a, another uh, big tusker and we, we filmed him. And then we went up to Kenya, the last remaining refuge of the other super tuskers. And pictured in this image is a magnificent tusker on the right hand side there called Tim, who sadly passed away of natural causes just a few months ago, early, earlier this year. And he was one of the most famous and iconic elephants. Like Ahmed was in the 1970s, Tim has become to Amboseli National Park what Ahmed and Muhammad were to Masabit Forest in Kenya. And so I went up to Kenya and I started filming these guys. And at the time that I started the film, there were an estimated 40 or so super tuskers left on our planet. And very sadly, when I brought out the film um, in 2018, that number had dropped to 22. And so I want to just play you this brief video clip of one of the most fantastic elephants alive, Tim. And just to give you some history about Tim, he, he, had, he was such an elephant of such stature that he had six Ascaris, which are younger bulls in their sort of late 20s to early 30s, who will take care of this older elephant until the day that he dies. And it's a very important part of male elephant society, the Ascaris or the protectors who will guide him through the last years of his life. They will protect him with their lives sometimes and they will help him to find water and food. And it's believed, we don't know this for sure, but it's believed that in return, the old elephant, like Tim in this case, passes on the knowledge of what it takes to be a good elephant in elephant society. And we can draw a lot of parallels to, to our own human society with that and fathers leaving home and abandoning their, their sons at an early age. Um, this very similar thing can happen in elephant society. When you don't have older bulls, young bulls run rampant and they'll start mating with rhinos, they'll start pushing over cars, they'll start attacking tourists. So elephant society really needs a, a good proportion of older elephants for it to function really well. So enjoy this little brief video of Tim. And it's a very rare piece of video because in this video, you see not only one super tusker, but two. Tim, now the largest of the remaining tuskers in Amboseli, was recently fitted with a radio collar. He knows we are here. His Ascaris have warned him and he hides his tusks. This behavior has been widely reported by scientists. It's as if the tuskers know the danger of exposing their ivory to humans.
With no more than 25 big tuskers alive today, it's a huge privilege to see Tim and Craig together. Tim is substantially larger and appears almost mammoth-like. Craig, younger and quite edgy, is already a hundred pounder with the potential to grow into a truly massive super tusker. But they are both in danger. They are miles outside the protected boundary of the park. It's not hard to understand why these elephants have become crop raiders. This part of the park is unfenced, and a concentration of succulent irrigated crops just nearby would be hard to resist in these drought conditions. So that's the wonderful Tim and Craig of Amboseli National Park in Kenya. And there's quite a few remaining super tuskers. At last count, I think there were six or seven in Savo National Park as well. And then a few scattlings elsewhere. Um, there's a couple in Tanzania and a few in Northern Kenya. But to, to be quite honest, um, 22 left, maybe 21 left now after Tim's passing. And it's very, very sad. So we ventured in the film to Amboseli and to Tsavo and to the Chulu Hills area to film another incredible elephant, um, inappropriately named One Ton, because he weighs a lot more than one ton. Um, and it was just fantastic filming these elephants. I just, Mishan, let's, let's take a quick break and see if anybody has any questions and maybe I can answer those before we move on. If you have any questions about these elephants or about elephant genetics and their tusks, please just share them in, on the messenger um, tab and, and Mishan will let me know and we can answer those for you. We did have one come in. Somebody asked how the elephants get their names. Is there a naming ceremony like there is with gorillas? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So no, there, there's no formal um, naming ceremony at all. Um, in fact, a lot of the elephants just get their names. Uh, some of them, in fact, if you go to, if you look at the elephants in Kruger National Park, for example, they actually get their names from game rangers or park wardens in that part of the uh, reserve. So a lot of the park wardens in, in Kruger National Park are given Zulu names. Some of them uh, are Zulu or Tswana or Sutu. Some of them are, are white English um, wardens and they're given these names and the elephants often take the names of those favorite park wardens. So I've got my cat in the, in the picture here, he's joining us. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, they, they get their names from, from those park wardens. And a lot of sort of people that get to know these elephants will sometimes name them in the early years before they become a super tusker. And then as they become more famous, obviously that name sticks. But there's no formal naming ceremony like there is with the gorillas. Thanks for the question. And that shot that you had of Tim, where it's from the ground looking up, did you have to plant your camera to get that shot? What did it take to get that picture? That's an awesome question. And I'm glad you asked it because stick around. I'm going to show you one of the most amazing pieces of video um, that'll show you the intelligence of elephants. And I'm going to leave it for the end of this presentation. But yes, to answer your question, basically, we used um, ordinary GoPro cameras, the very small GoPro cameras that we thought were very inconspicuous and that elephants wouldn't see. And we were sorely mistaken as we found out the hard way on this. And you'll see at the end of the presentation what I'm talking about. But yes, we would put those down and then try and get the elephants walking down their elephant paths, which they use um, with regularity day in and day out. So if they're going to walk down a path, you know where they're going to go because they follow that same movement every day when they go out of the park into the communities to feed in those fields because that's what Tim used to do on a daily basis. And so we'd put down that GoPro and hope that, that the elephants would walk past. So stick around. You'll see some interesting stuff about how elephants are, are so intelligent with, 
regard to cameras. And in fact, um, elephants are, I believe, truly camera shy. They really are. Um, so thanks for that question. Any more, Mishan, before we move on? We'll take one more if there is. We have about four more. Okay, well, let's take one more now and then we could start with those. Um, we'll take another break or at the end. Sure, okay, next is from Rachel. Are the Have a tonic quickly while, while you ask the question. <laughs> Are the Tuskers not protected? And if they're moving through an area like a reserve, when are they protected and when are they not? Again, uh, another very good question. So a lot of the parks in Africa don't have fences. So what happens is that elephants will move out of the parks, especially when there are drought-like conditions. So there's only so much protection you can offer an elephant when it leaves the protective boundary of a park. And so what Tim and his Ascaris would do on a daily basis during the dry season is that head out of the park into the communities and raid the shambas or the maize fields in the villages of, uh, you know, maize corn and, you know, spring onions and all the delectables that the local people are planting. And of course, the local people are trying to eke out a living in these drought conditions at the same time. So there's, uh, one of the biggest threats to these big tuskers is human elephant conflict in this part of Kenya. And so there have been some very successful conservation initiatives where um, people, because these elephants get speared at night, the villagers will lose hundreds of dollars in one night caused by these elephants, just raiding an entire feed, uh, field of, of maize. Um, and so we have to take care of the livelihoods of these communities. And a nonprofit has come up with a great idea here is that elephants are terrified of bees, absolutely terrified. And so this nonprofit came up with this ingenious way to mitigate that human wildlife conflict by putting up what are called beehive fences. And basically you put a beehive suspended by two wires and two poles every, you know, 10 to 12 feet surrounding a maize field. And as the elephants, try to get in there, they'll bump the wires or they'll bump the fence. It'll shake the beehives and the bees will come out and they'll attack the elephants and they're terrified. So they, they run away. They hate bees. In fact, when we tried to film some of these elephants with a drone, uh, the same thing happened. We had to be very uh, ethical and very careful when filming elephants with a drone because they think they're bees and they just, they just take off. They cannot stand drones. Um, and so that's been very successful. But the, to answer your question, the long and short of it is, no, once they leave the park, they're in serious danger. But there are a lot of nonprofits on the ground that will, you know, track an elephant like Tim. There's an organization called Big Life Foundation that does great work around Amboseli, following his movements because he is now collared so they can see where he's going. Well, he was before he died, sorry. Um, and then in Savo, the Savo Trust is another nonprofit on the ground there that is monitoring and day doing almost daily aerial surveys of big tusker elephants and making sure that they don't get out of the parks there. And some of you might remember an iconic elephant called Satao, um, who died literally, um, literally a hundred feet from the park boundary in Savo. Um, he left the park and within a hundred feet of him leaving that park boundary, uh, he was shot and killed by poachers with poisoned arrows, unfortunately. Um, and, and so it is a huge problem for them when they leave those protected areas. Thank you for the question. And we'll move on a little bit if we may, and then we'll take some more of those questions at the end. I'm around all night. I've got a gin and tonic. I'm happy. I can stick around. We can take questions for as long as you guys want. Um, I wanted to just pause on this slide quickly to just tell you a little bit about the emotional intelligence and the connection that I believe we have as a species to elephants. And this is a, an image of me looking at a Tembi elephant as it walked right up to me and looked me straight in the eye within a foot of me. It actually put its trunk onto my shoulder and just touched my shoulder with its trunk. He was a, a middle-aged bull. And when he looked in my eyes, I, I started thinking just how similar we are to elephants. We, go through puberty at roughly the same age as elephants a little bit earlier than us. Um, the mothers and the matriarchs have this incredibly strong family bond where they will take care of their youngsters and for, 
for years and years and years, a long developmental phase, just like us. Matriarchal elephants and female elephants have a set of mammary glands between their front legs that look remarkably like human breasts, um, albeit a little bit more wrinkly. Um, and and they, they have this protective nature that they're so, so similar to us. The mother elephant will do anything to to save its baby, to protect its young. They have remarkable memories. In fact, I believe that elephants have way better memories than we do as a species. And it's also believed that elephants show a wide range of emotions, um, right from sadness to distress to heartache. Um, it's believed that elephants mourn their dead. And I'm going to finish off uh, in this presentation with the slide as well, coming up soon, of an aerial shot of an elephant, an elephant's remains. It's actually a silo, the big tusker that I was telling you about. And just to prove to you, those of you that don't believe that elephants mourn their dead, this is, if I've ever I've seen proof, this is it. Um, and I'll show that to you later. But also, they're one of the only animals on earth that are self-aware. And the way that you test this in a species is, if you paint a pink or a colored spot on an animal's face and then you show it a mirror, will the animal recognize that spot on its face? And so they've done this with a, a wide range of intelligent species like baboons, monkeys, other primates, and they don't recognize it. They have no idea except for the great apes. So chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans are self-aware. If you paint a dot they'll, and you show them a mirror, they will wipe that off. Cetaceans, whales and dolphins. If you paint waterproof paint on, on a dolphin and you show it a mirror, it'll try to rub that, that spot off or it'll look strangely at that spot and, and identify it as a blemish on its face. And likewise, elephants are the only. So it's only ourselves, the great apes and the cetaceans that are self-aware. So next time you see elephants looking at themselves in their reflection at a watering hole, rest assured that they're not just drinking. There's the odd female there looking to see how her eyelashes are looking, are her eyelashes in place. There's a male elephant maybe sort of walking up and having a look underneath him to see how well endowed he is. And uh, is, he, is he one of the big boys in the herd? So elephants are definitely very self-aware. They show a, a wide range of emotions and, and they have this strong connection to us as a species. And, you know, just recently, a few years ago, they found out that elephants can tell the difference between subtle differences in human language, human language, not their language. So they took a group of elephants that resided um, in an area where there were two tribes and one, the Maasai and another tribe, I think called the Kamba people. I might be, I might be wrong. We'll need to check the, the language there, but anyway, two tribes, one who were pretty aggressive towards elephants because they destroyed their crops and the other who lived very harmoniously with this group of elephants. And they, they, these, these tribes spoke the same language, but different dialects. So it's like South African English versus American English. And they played recordings of the warriors and the women and children from these two tribes. And when they played from the tribe that was um, anti-elephants, not anti-elephants, but aggressive towards elephants, the elephants that played that audio, that language, the elephants disappeared and got aggressive um, and, and moved out of the area. When they played the language of the peaceful tribe that was peaceful towards them, the elephants were totally calm and settled. And so it amazes me that we haven't even learned their language yet, but we kill them. And to me, that's a huge tragedy because killing an elephant to me is like, like killing a person. And this is an aerial drone shot of the remains of Isilo, the beautiful elephant I told you about at the beginning of this story. And this is proof that elephants mourn their dead because Isilo died in a remote part of the park. Um, in a little clearing, an otherwise almost inaccessible sand forest, no particular water source around or anything that elephants would go to visit. 
Yet when you look at his remains from the air, you'll see a distinctive path going in and a path going out. And that path is created by the other elephants at Tembi that come to his remains frequently. They stand around them and they pass his bones from elephant to elephant, sometimes from older elephant to younger elephant, as if to remember this once legendary and amazing creature that was a leader in their society. And so elephants definitely mourn, in my opinion, and we've got to be careful as scientists that we don't anthropomorphize or put human qualities onto animals. But if there's one species that we can do that with, it's undoubtedly elephants. And now I'm going to end off with the grand finale, a video that shows you, it's not playing yet. I'm going to click play when I'm finished, giving you the intro, but just shows you how incredibly intelligent elephants are because we were trying to get this amazing footage of Tim from the ground up and we put two cameras on either side of the path that they used every single day to go out of the park. And we thought we are definitely going to get these elephants when they walk down that path because we had the path in the middle and we had two GoPro cameras, one on either side of the path so that the elephants could walk between the two cameras. And so what I'm going to play you now is what happened. And you're going to see the elephants walk down the path. You're going to notice that the lead Ascari, Tim will be right at the back. The lead Ascari is going to, out of the corner of his eye, spot the cameras, sniff the cameras with his trunk, and make a very important decision for this herd. And so I'm going to play back these two cameras side by side to show you the remarkable intelligence of elephants and the fact that they are camera shy. So here they are, the two cameras on either side of the path. They should walk straight down next to that tree between the two of them. Look at that lead Ascari sniffing. He sees the cameras, he sniffs, takes a detour. Watch this. Uh-uh, you're not filming me today. And there's Tim right at the back, this majestic ivory. And elephants definitely have a sense of humor too. They know that they've got to take the camera from the back. They can't be seen. And then they put it in their mouths. They walk off with them. Ever wondered what the inside of an elephant's mouth looks like? There you have it. They play a bit of football with the camera. And of course, we're watching this from a distance. And I'm thinking, oh no, we've lost our last two remaining cameras. We're done for. We're gonna have nothing left to film these guys with. And so we're watching from a, probably half a mile away. <laughs> and he ate our camera. <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> what happened here? The two. The two that come out. Tell me what happened. Oh dear. <laughs> the two that come out. Be honest. We took it for how far? 100 meters. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my god. So if you've ever wondered about the intelligence of elephants, there it is for you. 
in glaring proof, in my opinion. And I'm just going to close this off with a quick status on where we are now. Um, I produced this film as a conservation film to raise funds for the protection of these last remaining elephants, these amazing animals in Africa. And uh, it's a conservation film. It's definitely not a BBC type production, um, but I think we did a, an okay job um, bringing to light the, the plight of these animals. And what needs to happen now for not just the future of big tuskers in, in, in Africa, but the future of tusks in elephants. We don't want elephants to lose their elephantness. We want them to have tusks so that, you know, our grandkids and our, and our grandkids' kids can see elephants with ivory in the future. And so what's urgently needed is the funding to do genetic testing on these last remaining big tuskers. Find out where the big tusker gene comes from. Does it come from the cow or the bull or both? How can we isolate that gene and test for it? Because then we could dart a promising super tusker at the age of 25, find out that he's got the gene and give him presidential decree like Ahmed had, where he's protected and maybe relocate him to an area where there's tusklessness in an elephant population so that he can breed and perpetuate that gene so that hopefully one day we can get back to an Africa with beautiful tusked elephants again. Thank you all very, very much for listening. And we'll now take the remainder of the questions. And I don't know if we're able to open it up to people so that we can meet some of you and see your faces and hear your audio. If not, we'll just take your questions via message. Um, but thank you all very, very much for listening. And I hope you'll join me with a, a little drink if you do partake. Uh, have a gin and tonic with me and the team. And we'll, uh, we'll take some questions now. We do have a few questions that already came in in the, the chat. So I'll go through those. But there is a feature for people to raise their hand. So once I've gone through the written questions, we'll see if we can get that to allow some people to share their audio so we can hear them. And we're going to give away two copies, signed copies of my book, aren't we? Michelle? Yeah. Okay, good. You we'll get to that. Do, do you want to do that now? Sure. Let's do it. Okay, cool. The first question, and I'm sure you all listened really carefully. <laughs> this is the first person that successfully gets their message through to Mashan, the answer. First question is, can you name the two legendary elephants that lived in Marsabit Forest in northern Kenya in the 1960s and 1970s? Ooh, Paula, like a rocket. Um, Ahmed and Muhammad. Ahmed and Muhammad, well done. Paula, okay, you getting a signed copy of my book, well done. Paula, okay. that was impressive. Very impressive, lots of people listening. People okay. should that fast. <laughs> the next question, and I don't know if everybody will get this one because I only said it once, we'll see. What does the name Isilo translate to, the Zulu word Isilo in English? Annette, king of kings. Who said that? Annette Sardoni. Annette Sordoni. Oh my gosh. Welcome, Happy Annette. Freaky fast. Oh, Annette. Good to hear from you. I love Annette. She's amazing. Okay. Awesome. Well done, Annette. You're getting a signed copy of the book, although I think you might even have one already. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Michonne, you have some questions for me. Yeah. Let me scroll back up there. Let's see. Where did I leave off? Left off with Evelyn. What is the longest recorded lifespan of a super tusker? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question. So elephants in the wild, their lifespan is about 65 years old. Unfortunately, because these super tuskers, when they die, they are super ancient. There wasn't really good record keeping, you know, 65, 70 years ago. So a lot of the ages of super tuskers are actually estimations. Uh, so we estimate between 60 and 65 years or 55 and 60 years. But generally, the lifespan of a wild elephant is about 60 to 65 years. And they don't always die of old age. Often, often they die of starvation. So elephants have six sets of teeth throughout their lives. And as they get older, those teeth get worn down and get replaced by their final sets of teeth. 
So when they're on their last set of teeth, they're around the ages of 55 or so. And when that last set gets worn down, the elephants can no longer feed on the bark and the roots and the, the twigs of trees because they can't chew it. So a lot of these elephants then go to grassy areas to die. So a lot of people actually, you might have heard the saying, there's elephant graveyards out there where elephants go to a specific graveyard to die. Well, that's not necessarily a case of elephants wanting to remain entombed together for life in a graveyard. It's a case of elephants going to a grassy area because they have no other choice. And essentially wild elephants, when they get older, they almost die of starvation rather than old age. And so in captivity, elephants can live to ages approaching ours. You know, 70, 75 um, is not uncommon for a captive elephant where their diet can be supplemented with the vitamins and nutrients needed from the box and the, and the root and the, the fruit of tree, trees that they need to chew. Thanks for the question. You answered one of the questions with your slide here. How can you watch Last of the Big Tuskers on Vimeo is where you can find it. Yes, on Vimeo and it's, uh, I think it's $5.95 or so to download the film. Um, it's about 52 minutes long. So it just takes you through our journey to find these big tuskers. You've heard most of it in this presentation, I might add. So I hope I didn't give away the storyline too much, um, but there it is. Let's see, Cindy, are the elephants friendly to people or are dangerous? Yeah, so look, elephants, in my opinion, elephants are friendly to people in areas where they haven't been hunted. Uh, and so there's a couple of factors. Remember that elephants are individuals just like us and you get grumpy elephants and you get calm elephants. And then you could throw in the fact that elephants also suffer from you know, medical conditions. Sometimes they have an abscess under their tooth and a, a relatively calm elephant can be calm for years and years and years. And then one day it's got an abscess. It's an absolute pain. It's having a hell of a day. And some tourists come in a vehicle and they get too close to this elephant and it charges the vehicle and flips it. Now, that's just an elephant being grumpy because it's in pain. Um, and so elephants are just like us and we're very quick to judge when an elephant kills a person without actually knowing the understory. The fact that these elephants may, have, the, the particular individual may have been hunted in the past, had a very nasty experience with a human, with a poacher or a hunter. And uh, elephants never forget that. They'll carry it with them their entire lives. And so I believe, yes, in areas where elephants aren't affected by people negatively, calm, amazing, uh, but then bear in mind they are individuals too. Uh, and then in areas where, where they have been hunted and persecuted, you'll find elephants very grumpy and, and wanting to push people out of the areas, especially matriarchs when they've got calves and also bulls when they come into must. And must, must is when they have this heightened uh, sense of sexuality, their, their body has been pumped full of testosterone and they become very aggressive, just like a, a teenage boy. I've got one in the house here with me and <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't hear me because I think he might come and try to beat me up. He's getting stronger these days, somewhere around. <laughs> well, Annette confirmed she does not have a copy of her book, so we picked the right winner. Oh, good, excellent. Any other questions? Yes, from Stephanie Fisher, she says, it's great to see you. And she's wondering, when you finally find these Tuskers, do you collar them so that you can find them again? Yeah, so some of the, yeah, it's a very difficult and very controversial subject, whether you um, collar a Tusker. And there's a number of reasons for that. So when you, when you collar an elephant, you have to dart it with a tranquilizer. It's very traumatic for the animal. And remember, these elephants are older, so they're very old. It's very dangerous to dart an elephant. The, the tranquilizer that we use to dart elephants is very strong. It's not an easy drug for them to recover from. And then secondly, there's a chance that their ivory breaks when they fall to the floor. And here we are protecting these elephants for their ivory. We dart them, we collar them, and there's a chance that we can actually break their tusks in the process. So we generally try not to collar elephants. In the case of Tim, he was collared. Um, and I think a couple of the other elephants have been collared in the past, but generally it's something that I would stay away from just for the health and safety of those elephants. And I would prefer to 
to actually spend the resources to follow those elephants, you know, on a daily basis and offer them this presidential decree. With only 21 or so of them left, it's time that African governments realize the importance of these creatures as ambassadors for elephant, elephants worldwide um, and that they need to be offered this protection. And we need to put boots on the ground to support the nonprofits that are doing incredible work trying to protect the last remaining ones. Um, let's see. Okay, we are through our written questions. So let's see if anybody wants to click that button at the bottom of their screen to raise their hand. And we should be able to unmute you so that you can speak your question instead of having to type it. Anybody raising their hand? This is like, this is like a virtual classroom, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We have Becca helping us in the background and... Oh, there's Rachel. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. What's your oh. question, Rachel? Um, I'm just wondering if, if people um, in Africa are becoming um, more, I guess, kind or open to the elephants. Um, I know, like you said, that they have a hard time because they come onto their property and they eat their food. So is there um, things sort of happening in Africa that um, in these places that the people are, are learning more about the elephant that they, so they can all coincide together and not see them as a threat and that they're taking their food? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So critical to this are projects like fencing, whether it's, fencing in the forms of a of an almost permanent barrier or a more ingenious project like these beehive fences it's critical to to stop problem elephants from interacting with people both for the people's perspective and from the elephant's perspective so so yes there, there is a lot of hope where these projects are taking place and i, I believe that african african communities in general are actually very sympathetic to wildlife um, and, and have a lot of patience. When you look at these shambas and, and you look at these, village, these villages that are, are raided almost on a nightly basis by, by Tim and his Ascaris in, in, you know, just a few years ago before he died, um, you know, yes, he's been speared a few times and yes, he's been had stuff thrown at him, and, but they also are losing a, a, a very precious form of income in the form of their maize crops. And, and we're talking very impoverished communities. So we absolutely need to form some kind of mitigation between um, people and obviously elephants. But then there are great shining examples of where local communities can actually benefit from the tourism process so that they receive direct tangible benefits from elephants being on their land. And a great example of this is Tembi Elephant Park. And I'll encourage those of you that, that have traveled to Africa and want to see some of the strongest genetics for big tuskers in Africa, Tembi Elephant Park in Northeastern South Africa is a fantastic option. It's a community run lodge. It's, the land is all run by the local Tembi people who gave up this land for the elephants. And we're now working on a project, the Tembi chief, in fact, with the launch of our film in South Africa, agreed to donate a whole bunch more land to open up the habitat of these elephants. And hopefully one day, our goal, myself and a bunch of conservationists, our goal is to link Tembi Elephant Park all the way down south to Pinder Private Game Reserve and beyond uh, and form that old ancient elephant migration route that they used to follow. And elephants are very clever. They'll start walking those old migration routes again and it's, it's my real hope that we can link these elephant corridors up because that's really the future of elephant con uh, conservation in Africa. And with the help of communities like the Tembi community who are receiving direct benefits from tourism to their park, I believe that's a winning recipe for both the elephants and the people of Africa. Thank you for the question, Rachel. Thank you. Anybody else want to raise their hand? We do have one that came in via the chat. 
Yeah. Let's see. Um, sorry, scrolling. What can be done about areas that allow elephant hunting? Yeah, that's a very, it's a very difficult question. Um, I think Kenya is probably the only country that has a total ban on, on, ele on elephant hunting now, um, sadly. Um, so in most countries in Africa, elephant hunting is done on a, a semi-sustainable basis where um, obviously you can't hunt in tourism areas. There's specific elephants that you are allowed to hunt. And, um, and so you have to be very, very careful you know, if you're a hunter going to Africa, you can't just shoot an elephant in a, in a tourism area. You're going to have to get permits and you're going to have to go through the whole process. Um, but it's, it's my belief that we really need to lobby government and show government that an elephant alive is worth way more than the short-term goal of an elephant dead. And I think that's where a company like Alluring Africa comes into this and a company like Wilderness Safaris, our organization, because we're the people on the ground who are bringing in tourism dollars. And you guys that travel to Africa, you don't need to dig in your pockets to give money to elephant conservation. It's great if you would. But just by traveling to Africa, you are showing and demonstrating to African governments the importance of conserving these majestic creatures, not just elephants, but lions are hugely imperiled across the continent. We've lost 25%, sorry, 50% of the wild population of lions in the last 25 years. Think about that for a moment. 20, uh, 25 years and we've lost 50%, half of the continental population of lions in Africa. Think about what's happening with rhinos. Think about what's, what's happening with giraffe. Giraffe are in serious trouble. So. So really, we, we, we have to really lobby these governments. And the best way we can do that is as soon as this coronavirus passes, get hold of Alluring Africa, get hold of your travel agent, and come visit us in Africa, because that's the way you'll make the biggest impact. I'm glad you brought that up, because we're actually working on a series of impactful itineraries where we'll, we're going to do our best to focus an itinerary on a topic like elephant conservation or big cats we're featuring namibia next week and they do so much there with the the lines who've adapted to that desert environment so things like reforestation we have a whole list of topics where we're trying really hard to come up with a perfect itinerary to focus on a topic like that so we'll be launching that soon and back to questions we have cindy what is africa doing about poaching Oh my gosh. Oh, Africa is such a big place. And it's, it's, uh, what's the size of the iceberg really with that question? Because, you know, we only see the tip of the problem. Um, when we're talking about the popular tourism destinations like Southern Africa and East Africa, but when you start going into places like West Africa, where there's very little tourism, um, there's a major problem with poaching. And so we're very fortunate in the areas in which we operate as a, as a business, uh, Southern Africa, um, Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, when you go up to Tanzania and, uh, and Kenya and even Rwanda now, um, these are areas which are, their economies are underpinned by very strong tourism economies. And so a lot of money can then go into anti-poaching. But when you get to places like Chad, which has beautiful parks like Zakuma National Park, and you get to places like Senegal and West Africa, where there's a critically endangered subspecies of lion, the West African lion, for example. There's no tourism dollars to support these animals. And so it's nonprofits. It's organizations like African Parks that are getting involved. It's organizations like WCN, Wildlife Conservation Network, that's got a great um, organization underneath it called the Lion Recovery Fund and the Elephant Crisis Fund, which, are, which aim to, to protect elephants on a continental level. So I believe that the future of conservation in Africa to combat poaching, amongst other things like habitat loss, is 
collaborative conservation. And I think that this needs to become the next buzzword in conservation. We've heard about community-based conservation and community conservation and sustainable conservation. Let's now talk collaborative conservation, where all of us in the industry can get together, like part of the Lion Recovery Fund, what we're doing there, for example, is we formed something called the Lionscapes Coalition, where wilderness safaris, along with our strongest competitors on the ground and beyond, and Great Plains, and the likes of Singita, and all these other companies have joined together to make a difference, because together we can do so much more for lions and for elephants on the continent. And I think that collaborative conservation is the future because that's how we combat poaching, is ensuring that there's a, a, tourism, a tourism presence in these more marginalized areas of Africa. So we really need to get together organizations, businesses, nonprofits, and governments, um, and of course, tourists that come to visit and all get together and, and save Africa's wildlife because it is in serious trouble. I love that term collaborative and it's something that we do here in the States as well. So with all of our main competitors, we're all in this group called Safari Pros and we also get together and every year we vote on our favorite conservation efforts from our partners like Wilderness Safaris and it's, it makes a way bigger difference to be able to do that with other people than try and tackle it yourself. Absolutely. Um, Mishan, should we take one final question before we close it down? We have, let's see, so Paula mentioned that she was in Savo and Amboseli back in 1978. That's amazing. She was run off the road by a rhino. Oh my gosh. <gasps> Paula around the campfire. Excellent. From Marissa. So you mentioned that the elephant Tim, he did pass away, but remind us whether that was from natural causes or something else. Who, Tim? Tim. Tim passed away uh, from natural causes, thankfully. Um, and yes, so he, he was not poached. Um, uh, there was another magnificent, you'll meet some other characters in the film. You'll meet a, a fantastic elephant called Camboyo, who had the straightest ivory that touched the ground. And I, I never actually got to see Camboyo from the ground. I only got to see him from the air. And, uh, he was a magnificent elephant. I mean, just incredible. And he also thankfully died of natural causes, thanks to the protection of the Tsavo Trust, an organization that's doing great work with these big tuskers, Big Life Foundation, another organization doing incredible work, the Tembi Tusker Foundation, doing great work in Tembi Elephant Park. And I'd like to just do a quick shout out, if I can, to Nick Brandt as well, uh, who gave me the permission to use his wonderful image here um, Nick Brandt is involved with Big Life Foundation as well. And look at some of his photography work. He is a fantastic photographer who really sheds light on some of these big tuskers as well. So go check out Nick Brandt, fantastic guy. We'll do one final question from Samantha. What do you think th that coronavirus will have in terms of its effect on poaching? Oh, probably the most important question of, of this entire webinar. Thank you for that. And it's very important for us to realize while, while we're all in lockdown and in self-isolation in our homes and safari lodges are closing, you know, by the minute across the continent in Africa, this is when poachers see it as an opportunity. And sadly, this is a time where because there's not a lot of tourism presence on the ground and because nonprofits on the ground are having to scale back on their operations and are suffering because of funding, because right now people are thinking about themselves and their families versus conservation in Africa. It's a critical time for conservation in Africa. So what we're doing as an organization, Wilderness Safaris, and I'm sure uh, some of our competitors too, is we're trying to maintain a presence on the ground. We're not closing all of our camps. We're trying to maintain a presence in our concessions so that we can perform the vital conservation work during this time. And we do have funding that we've managed to raise over the years through the Wilderness Trust um, and other organizations. So we are applying those funds very carefully to make sure that conservation efforts remain on the ground. Um, we're very pleased that some of our African partners in government, like the Zimbabwean government, for example, regards poaching or anti, sorry, anti-poaching, not poaching, uh, regards anti-poaching as an essential service. 
And so poachers are, I mean, anti-poaching units are still allowed to operate and combat poaching during this coronavirus time. And more and more African countries are doing that, which is really good to see. But it's going to be a very, very trying time for Africa's wildlife. And I'm very, very worried about the future of Africa's wildlife during this coronavirus time because of the lack of funding. So if we can spread the word out there, um, two things we can do. Support organizations during this time if we have the financial means to do so. And secondly, when Africa opens up again, like I said, come and visit and travel because we need to get back um, to the sustainability of our business in future for, for the whole of Africa. And sustainability of conservation in Africa is successful ecotourism, involving communities, and effecting converse, uh, conservation on the ground. Those three pillars, it's like a, a three-legged African pot. If you take away one of those legs, the pot falls over. And so you have to have all three pillars. You have to have a successful ecotourism business. You have to have effective community engagement with direct tangible benefits going to those communities. And you have to have effective conservation on the ground to expand the green frontiers in Africa. And with that, I'm going to thank you all very well. I'm going to take another sip of my gin and tonic and bid you good night. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you for organizing Alluring Africa. Thank you, James, for your passion, for your work, and for your time. We are honored to have spent the evening with you. And I'm so grateful to learn more about what you're doing. And I'm sure everybody wants to know a little bit more too. So if you go to bigtuskers.com, that website will link directly to the Vimeo video to make it easier for you to find that. And if you have any travel related questions, you can reach out to Alluring Africa at hello at alluringafrica.com or you can call us at 321-622-9372. We do have some upcoming webinars. We're shooting for every Tuesday at 7 p.m. So next week, a student and I will be back to go through the second half of our trip going through Namibia. And then the week after, I'll be with my coworker Liz and we'll be bringing Botswana to you. And again, our contact details, it's hello at alluringafrica.com. And then the phone number is 321-622-9372. Thank you everybody for joining us. It was a pleasure to spend the evening with you. We enjoyed your questions. Thank you for being engaged and we'll talk to you next week. Bye everybody.